We want to start our program today by acknowledging that it's taking place in the unceded territory of Little Watt Nation. Uh, this is the last tale of the season, but it's one of my favorite ones, and it's so spooky. <laughs> Our theme this year is myths and legends, and we've been featuring speakers from throughout the Sea to Sky because we share history in the region, especially over the last 160 years, and we featured two Indigenous speakers from Mount Curry, and today we have Professor Matthew Unger, who's visiting us from Montreal. Oh, wow. Thank you. I'm sure he's regretting his pick of dates. <laughs> <laughs> but he was out uh, doing some research at the University of Victoria. So just uh, a last explanation of our theme this year. It's myths and legends. And we chose a theme of myths and legends because we're celebrating 160 years of Pemberton being a place name on European maps. And myths and legends tend to be the oldest and sometimes the most informative stories we have about the distant past. A myth explains why the world is the way that it is. A legend tells us how we work. I want to thank the volunteer bakers this season, and I'm going to read it out. We had Annette Gordon, Katie Dorian, Anna's Cake Kitchen, Fran Cuthbert, Val Mahenny, Sarah Dawes, Connie Sobchak, Judy McNulty, Roland and Monique Midgley, Betty Mercer, Louise McDonald, and Carol Murphy. And the baking, I don't know if you guys sampled it all through the summer, but it was fantastic. <laughs> and we'd especially like to thank all of you for supporting this program. We've had a great, steady local turnout this year, and uh, we really appreciate the support. Just a reminder to all of you that we do film these presentations for the historical record, and then we make them available on our website and on our YouTube channel, so you can always watch a tale after the fact if you missed it. So today, I'd like to introduce you to Professor Matthew Unger, and he's an assistant professor in sociology and anthropology at Concordia University in Montreal. His continuing projects focus on accusation and governance, nature and law, and Paul Ricoeur's thought on symbols of fault. He's a co-editor of Accusation, Creating Criminals, a UBC publication. And he's currently working on entryways to criminal justice, accusation and criminalization in Canada, and it'll be out next year. Professor Unger contacted us a few years ago because uh, he was doing research on this Tom Poole murder. And we were thrilled that his vacation plans enabled his visit to Pemberton during our Teen Tales program, and especially that he could be here in person to share some of his thoughts. We've uh, put together, staff here put together an outline of the Tom Poole murder as we have it recorded in our history book and from scraps that we had in the archive. Margaret Fulberg, the previous curator, would go physically to the archives in Victoria, take notes, type them up, and that's what we have in our archive. But over his trip here, Matthew has gone to the archives and photographed this today with cell phones photograph the original primary source documents. Anyway, this tale has many twists and turns to it. <coughs> now, we don't have too many, we don't have any pictures of this era. This is uh, 1879, so all we have are some photos taken of the area later. And uh, this slideshow will show you photos of what was called the second halfway house because the first one burned down. What we're going to cover is, uh, I'm going to outline the history of the murder, the, give you the context, the cast of characters, the murder itself, the investigation. And then Professor Unger is going to walk us through his interpretations in relation to colonial identity, the nature of the accusations, and some of the archival documents he's unearthed. And uh, we'll basically just then have a conversation about the difference between the legend and the records. This is the uh, spookiest photo we could find. <laughs> so this was a photo taken of the second halfway house that was built on the site of the first one. And this photo was taken by Slim Foberg in 1958. So the murder of Tom Poole and his two young children happened during a major period of transition along the Douglas Trail. With the opening of the Yale-Lillouette route, 
all that traffic moved to that route and traffic along the route through here decreased and business interests moved further north to Lillooet and beyond. In 1877, you'll recall, the Pemberton Portage Trail had been improved for the cattle drive using $5,000 worth of funds. Now Robert Carson tried to use the trail and found it in such bad repair that a legislative hearing occurred to look into what happened because they'd spent $37,000 back in 1877 and uh, it wasn't much of a trail. <laughs> so it was the following year in the still isolated community called the Long Portage, the 50 mile portage between Port Pemberton and Port Anderson that the Poole family was massacred. These were desperate times and gold and goods and security in the district were scarce. So let's walk you through our cast of characters. <coughs> and again, these are just photos we have of uh, <coughs> the Tom Poole house. <coughs> This is current day Pool Creek. So Tom Pool, he bought Dickinson's halfway house, which was built during the height of the gold rush in 1859. Tom was a widower and had two children, Mary and Perry, aged 11 and 8 years. He'd been married to a Lillawat woman, perhaps a sister of Johnny Sandy, but she died in 1876, Tom Pool's wife, so he was a widow. James Douglas remarked of the halfway house in 1860 during his journey along the Douglas Trail. And he said it's prettily situated on the mountainside overlooking a rich expanse of arable land covered with a profusion of potatoes, beets, carrots, tomatoes, and other vegetables. Certain proof of the great capabilities of soil and climate in this region. Tom was considered a man of means and he was rumored to have $20,000 in $20 gold pieces at Halfway House. He was also the first man to have running water in his house as Pool Creek ran right through it. <laughs> <laughs> Another character was Hunter Jack of Shalal. His name, his traditional name was Tash Poli, we've seen it spelled, also Talip Posey, also in Kick Tea, that comes from the Irene Edwards book. And he was born at 22 Mile Post. He, was, he had a very large family and several wives. And our understanding is he was the chief of the Anderson Band of the day. He ruled the Bridge River like a sovereign. And he had a trap line in the region and his own private gold mines. He held pot latches for his friends and gave presents of gold nuggets. He often gave the most amazing accounts of hand-to-hand -hand fighting with the beasts of the wilds, and these were often embellished by the white prospectors who passed them along. He's remembered in oral traditions as the chief who brokered peace between the Nkwakwa and the Chilcotans, as per a story by Baptiste Ritchie in 1970. <clears throat> he wintered with two Chilcotan men who were starving and in short supplies. He promised not to kill them, though they were enemies. And because of his efforts, the men returned to the Chilcotin camp in the spring, and the nations have been peaceful ever since. He died in an accident on Seton Lake when he fell in his canoe, banging his head on an oarlock. Shatley and others in the region contend that he was murdered by men seeking to force him to, to give up his secret gold mine, which remains lost today. He was buried at Darcy, and his son Tommy Jack was the chief at Darcy for many years. After his death, Mission Peter, a packer into the mines from Shalat, led some men in Tyotin to try to find Hunter Jack's cache of gold. They were unsuccessful, and no one has ever discovered his gold mine. Mission Peter was so spooked by the experience, he swore his men to secrecy and to never return to that area again. All right, our next character was William Scotty Halliday. He was one of the first preemptors in the area, initially preempting land near Port Pemberton in 1861. He lived with Jenny, a wife of Hunter Jacks. He was listed as one of the men hired to construct the cattle trail along with his friend Walter Waddy Burgess. The murder. Jim Queen, the brother of Tom Poole's dead wife, found the halfway house burned right down to the piles of smoking potatoes in what had been the basement. Or, 
a group of miners discovered the smoking remains. There's many notes on this. Lying there side by side were the bodies of Poole and his 11-year-old daughter Mary. Nearby bones might have been the remains of 8-year-old Perry, whose cap was found hanging on the branch of a tree. So very grisly. <coughs> the investigation. <coughs> Constable Arthur Fair, son of the Lillooet Corner, traveled down to the portage to examine the two bodies. Poole had a caved-in skull. His daughter had a bullet hole in the skull, and the boy's body was found under the stove. Or, Poole's throat was cut, Mary was stabbed, and there were no remains found in Paris. <laughs> Poole had recently sold cattle and had accumulated $20,000 $20, in gold pieces. Due to a tip from Scotty Halliday, Hunter Jack was arrested on suspicion of murder and taken by way of cattle trail to Lillooet and on to Clinton for trial. Scotty had even persuaded Constable Livingston that Hunter Jack was responsible, and Livingston actually deputized him so that he could go and catch Hunter Jack. When Hunter Jack was not found guilty, suspicion fastened on Scotty. Earlier, Halliday had appropriated Hunter Jack's wife, Jenny, whose conversation with her friend Sophia was part of the evidence at Hunter Jack's trial. Jenny told Sophia that Scotty arrived home with his helper, Tenna, and some pack horses two nights before Queen discovered the bodies. Scotty sat down to supper without removing his coat, and not until bedtime did Jenny see the arm of his shirt was bloodstained from cuff to shoulder. Um, the policeman assigned to the case Livingston ferreted out more details. After dusk on April 21st, Halliday and Tana pulled into the halfway house with five horses loaded with peas, barley, and flour, and planned to eat with the pools and spend the night with them. After the meal, the quick-tempered Scotty quarreled with Poole, and the next morning, as the quarrel continued, Poole reproached Scotty for stealing Hunter Jack's wife. Tana went out alone to get the pack horses ready to move on, and was halfway to the First Nation village where Halliday lived, with Jenny before his employer caught up with him riding at a gallop. Scotty's neighbors, Dan Carey, Walter Burgess, came to supper that night, and during the next day, Jenny revealed Halliday and Burgess had a long conversation in private. The following day, Jim Queen reported the fire and the bodies, and before galloping off with William Macbeth, another neighbor, to see what remained, Scotty pushed a roll of bills into Waddy's hands. Later, Wadi and Tana saddled up and headed off along the road to Lillooet Lake on their way to Victoria. Having collected a sheaf of signed statements, Livingston arrested Halliday, rode off with him to Clinton, and there wired the Victoria police and told them to arrest Burgess and search him. When the jury disagreed at the Clinton trial, Scotty was taken to New Westminster and waited 12 months in jail until November of 1880 for another trial. The judge's summing up of 14 days of evidence lasted from 2.30 in the afternoon till 11 o'clock at night, and the jury came back at 1 a.m. the next day with a verdict of not guilty. This is a map that uh, Matthew found in his travels that shows the original Gold Rush Trail, and it uh, is marking the pool property right here approximately 12 miles from what was then called Pemberton. Halliday, Dan Carey, and Walter Burgess made tracks to Clinton after the acquittal and pulled up all ties in Pemberton. By one account, all three men were cursed despite the acquittal. One later hanged himself. The second, a sly-looking fellow, went crazy in his cabin up the Fraser, where he always had a gun standing by the window. And a third, Scotty Halliday, had quite a bit of money and died a few years later. For a few years after Halliday's acquittal, settler interest in Pemberton dried up. The 1882 Lillooet voters list only had one name with a Pemberton address, that of William Macbeth. And this story has been a local legend since this time. Now in the archives, we've got a couple of other notes we wanted to share. And then I'll turn it over to 
Professor Unger. A Jewish pawnbroker named Budwick in Lillooet claimed that he saw the same gold pieces he'd given Tom Poole being used in the Lillooet area. Budwick was also a character witness for Scotty at the trial. Scotty had claimed that the wad of cash he was seen to be given Waddy was money he borrowed from Budwick so that Waddy could go see a dentist in Victoria. Father Sharus, who was serving in the area in, of Mount Curry around the time, said that through the confessional, the murder of the pools had been known to him and an innocent white man was blamed. As the years went by, suspicion was cast on a Chilcotin man named Namaya, who was chased by police all over the plateau to Butte Inlet. After a trial, he was sentenced to death in October of 1891, but was later pardoned, and now an old man was sent to the Chilcotin where, where he died many years later. Also, six years after the murder, Victoria's Supreme Court Registrar fled at the time he was expected to give account of the trusteeship of the two estates. He was found hiding on San Juan Island. This man, J.C. Prevost, visited Pemberton in 1880 and took inventory of the Poole estate. And then the Indian agent at Mount Curry, Vaughn Jones, writes, it was believed that Poole was robbed and murdered by Chilcotin after they learned he'd just received a large sum of money for a herd of cattle. The criminals, whoever they are, have never been arrested and the mystery of the tragic end of the Poole family is still unsolved. Johnny Ronan, when asked what he knew of Scotty and Waddy, said, I never met the gentlemen, but I know they were murderers. When my father came here in 1905, he'd been warned down below about the natives, but the natives told him it was Scotty and Waddy who murdered Tom Poole. This is a photo from 1900 from a packer named Ray Elliott, and it's showing the layout of the site and the Portage Road is right over there. So in the 1880s, Ronald Curry, who was the brother of John Curry, and John's sister, Annie McIntosh, built a new halfway house on the pool property despite being warned that it was haunted. Ronald operated a stagecoach on the portage and they were famed for their hospitality. When William Curry, the son of John, who was living with uh, Ronald and Annie, was digging the root cellar for the house, he found the ashes of the original Dickinson pool house. So we know that the second halfway house was built on the same site. And then a little bit later after them, We have uh, Mr. Law and Dr. Debbie. It's that same building. And they, uh, they lived at the property after the Currys. Now, uh, Mr. Law was an English immigrant and went overseas to serve in World War I. His wife had a baby, and that was the first baby born on the portage. Her name was Nancy. Mr. Law died overseas. And so shortly thereafter, Nancy and the baby left. Those are the only photos that we have of this building that no longer exists. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Unger at this point. Yeah, so I've been involved in this, as I've said, for a couple of years now. And, um, and it's come out, in, or it'll be coming out in a couple of papers uh, fairly soon. And so I'll kind of talk about them just a little bit. I don't want to get into too much detail about the papers themselves, but um, um, yeah, I'll just bring this up. Um, so my interest in this case came about through my initial sort of postdoc experience with my supervisor, George Pavlich. And so we spent uh, some time at the Victoria Archives and uh, yeah, was it maybe about three years ago, and and our task in this um, in this visit was just to document um, a ton of cases during this time. So we went into the archives. We were looking at between dates between uh, 1858 when 
uh, BC became um, British Columbia instead of the collection of colonies, and and they established a, const, a const, constabulary. Sorry, words. Um, where uh, yeah, so the first few um, constables were were brought in to police this this tremendous area um, and to establish uh, what they would call English law or the Queen's law um, in British Columbia during this time. And so during this time between 1858 and 1892 is a process of, of increasing formalization of law. And so what that means is that people, uh, lawmakers were um, trying to formalize law as much as possible and make it sort of uh, universal through through Canada and and within British Columbia it was particularly difficult during this time because it was uh, colonized quite a bit later than for example Lower Canada or Upper Canada uh, like Ontario and Quebec and like a couple hundred years later and so it was really sort of really fairly recently so a lot of the legal uh, problems that were kind of hashed out through a lot of interaction um, between indigenous peoples uh, the French and the English um, were just kind of starting in the in the 1800s um, in British Columbia and and um, and so we were interested in just documenting cases, and, and particularly we were interested in accusation, because um, we kind of thought that, or we think, and, um, and we think that accusation is this quite understudied field. Like we, when people study law, we either study sort of how people uh, end up in prison, or we study the court cases, but we don't actually study how people end up being accused of being a criminal, so how people become criminals. Um, and so I came upon this case, because um, I kept on just kind of um, finding documents, and finding documents of like more and more accusations. And so, um, and we'll go, I'll go through a bunch of these as well. And just like statements about the case that lasted from 1879, like all the way to 1891, and so I thought this was kind of just like a rich trove of like just baffling information. Um, but also for me, it was sort of an interesting um, uh, case study in how to like how are people accused and why are people accused uh, of crimes and at this like at this point in, in British law, uh, British Columbian law. And um, and so yeah, and so the I, so far I've written two papers that include this case, and the the first one will come out in that second book there, Interways to Criminal Justice, and and there I, I look primarily at, at this case, and I and I document in a lot more detail like all the different accusations, how these accusations were made possible, <clears throat> who were making them, um, how people were more accusable than others, who was more accusable than others, um, and what, what I argue in that, <clears throat> in, in that essay is that um, it's clear like the way in which different people were believed, for example, uh, Scotty uh, or James Halliday, <clears throat> he was much more easily believed by law than was um, his partner Jenny, who is an indigenous woman, or by um, there's an African American fellow, David Skinner, and his uh, testimony was also discounted really quickly. Um, so, so I think um, believability is really crucial for how a law functions, and I think we see that today in in a lot of criminal cases. Who who is to be believed, and, and witness statements, um, they're really sort of performative events. Um, and that's kind of how I talk about it in this, that, that, that people are more accusable based on who they were, uh, how they talked, um, what, kind of, um, what kind of information they would, they would display, what kind of connections that they had to the colonial government, and, 
other settler populations. Um, and, uh, and what we see is that indigenous peoples just were not believed um, and, and were really put through like stringent um, cross-examination as I just discovered more on this last trip to Victoria. <laughs> Um, and I'll talk about that in a second too. Uh, the second paper that's coming out, uh, um, there's a smaller section um, that I, I look at this case as well. Um, but what is interesting for me in that is um, with that paper is um, looking at law and nature. And, and so in that I kind of document some of the manhunts that were associated with this case and how law was really challenged just by the topography of the, of the area and the climate and things like that. So, I don't know, like some of the, um, some of the stories or some of the witness depositions and descriptions of, of these manhunts kind of sounded like the movie Revenant, like just these people like trudging through like difficult, like snowy places and then like reaching points where they could not go any further and then delayed until the next year, and then the next year, kind of, the, they just were going through the mountains, hunting for their man, and could not find it until, you know, and, yeah, and we'll go through, like, uh, some of that. Um, right now, what I'm, what I'm doing, and I haven't been able to incorporate this all yet, so, um, so if I, if I stumble over some of my narratives about this, it's because suddenly, I have come across like thousands of pages of information that I hadn't seen before. Um, so uh, my first visit, I, I found hundreds of pages, and that's what kind of kept me coming back to uh, this case. Is that it just took me like months to read, um, to go through, and just to interpret and understand. Because um, it's all handwritten, as you can kind of see here, like, like all the all the witness depositions and all the colonial correspondence are sometimes really nicely handwritten. Like, you know, then cursive writing was um, was a thing. <laughs> now um, we wouldn't see such writing. I don't think um, that's that's a skill that has been long lost. <laughs> but but I've also found a lot of handwriting that is in, inscrutable <laughs> completely. Um, but anyways, so on this last archive visit, I discovered um, entire bench books by the judge H.P.P. Cree. So he was one of the first judges uh, in British Columbia. I forget his, um, his exact dates, but he, it might have been between um, like starting early on, like in, in the 18, like 1858. Uh, along with Judge Begbie, uh, Matthew Bailey Begbie, who was uh, also the, who was the first judge of British Columbia, and then I found this um, this stack of documents. It's probably about like that big, I think, of all handwritten sort of copies of witness depositions and, and things like that. Um, and those are mostly nicely written, mostly. Uh, not all of them, but I wasn't able to, like there's just hundreds and hundreds of pages, so I didn't collect all of them, but I, I collected quite a bit. Um, but one of these, I think it was um, the second, or maybe the first bench book, uh, was really nicely written. And so I, I photographed the entire bench book, it, it was like 256 pages, <clears throat> um, and it details uh, the entire case. Um, all the witness depositions, all the trials, things like that. That's something I hadn't seen before, so I was like, um, you know, I was going to Victoria as a, uh, as a research trip, not necessarily looking for the pool case, but since I was coming to talk to, to, to you guys, I wanted to just kind of see if there's anything more. And then suddenly on my first visit, I'm like, oh my gosh, like all this stuff. And then the second bench book was inscrutable, <laughs> completely. Um, the third one was, was kind of a mixture, both nicely and anyways. Um, yeah, and then, and just more and more and more documents. Anyways, um, I think what we can do now is kind of go through a little bit of the, oh yeah, so this is um, a photo of the Ketterill House. Um, this is, 
Um, I'm guessing this is like the Ketterill house before Thomas Poole owned it. Um, yeah, there was a note that there were two different notes. So one had Poole taking over the halfway house after Dickinson <coughs> first preempted it. But uh, there was also a note that Ketterill, the Ketterill house, Ketterill was a South Virginian and he uh, ran a halfway house and that he had taken over Dickinson's. So this photo Matthew found in the archives called Ketterill House. So remember the photo I showed you of the Portage Road winding through? So we think this is the same. The trouble is, in the other photo, there's no ridge line, so you can't match up mountains. So we're just not exactly sure what we're looking at. Yeah. Um, and this was actually in, in, a, in a history book. Uh, I think this one is from Trails to Gold. And, you know, um, I'm pretty sure that's right, it. Right, but you said it was credited from the archives. Yeah, I'm credited from the archives, and so I tried to corroborate it. I tried to find it myself, and I couldn't find it. <clears throat> and I think that's just kind of the nature of archival research. Some people find some things, other people don't. <laughs> Um, okay. Anyways, um, so this is kind of an outline of, of what I have found um, related to the case. And I'll kind of just go through it and try to narrate a little bit in relationship to the story uh, of the accusations and of the people that were sort of involved in the case itself. Um, so uh, the murder happened. Um, I think Wednesday. It could have been April 24th. I just found today someone said April 24th. I was like, oh, come on. Um, <clears throat> anyways, um, so that's when it happened, but it, it was found in the court documents that I've, I've discovered. It was found um, by, um, by three indigenous people traveling to Anderson Lake. Um, Another fellow named Jim. It, it, it isn't. Um, there's a few people that are involved in this named Jim and Jack. Um, so I'll try to be careful with how I, I label them. But this is the first Jim. Um, it's not uh, the first Jack. Sorry, not Hunter Jack, um, but um, but a, a different Jack that discovers uh, discovers this scene. Any, and um, and so okay, I'll just go through these these documents first, and then we can talk a little bit more about the, the what what happened. Um, so the the first document that I find is from May fourth, eighteen seventy nine, and that is the first coroner's jury. So this is after um, uh, Jack um, discovers <coughs> discovers the. The scene, and he sends people to Anderson Lake really quickly. They raise the, the call for the chief, and that's Hunter Jack to to come in and um, and manage the scene and, and talk to the uh, the constable, Constable Livingston, at that time. And so Indigenous people were right at the very beginning, sort of really invested in sort of. Um, solving this and bringing this to to attention. And, and you said they paddled off to Lillibet, right? Right. Yeah. So when they um, when that first group of indigenous people made it to Anderson Lake, oh, that's right, Anderson Lake, they sent off uh, three boys or two boys. They sent off the boys um, to to Lillibet to. Um, to talk with uh, Constable Livingston and uh, and Hunter Jack or Captain Jack um, or maybe uh, would you pronounce it Tashpula? Or? Not sure. Yeah. Okay. That's sure. that's, um, that's how it's written in the in the coroner's jury uh, inquest. Um, at this at this inquest is kind of the first investigation, and so what they see there is that. Um, that Thomas Poole and they find Thomas Poole and his daughter um, burnt, and, and it's a grisly scene. 
planets. Um, and they discovered that um, despite Scotty's um, kind of persistent behavior, they discovered that, um, that they'd been murdered. So um, in the, the initial uh, coroner's jury, they see that Mary's throat has been slit and that Thomas Poole has been shot and, and they're just burned terribly. So <coughs> the descriptions are pretty, pretty grisly. Um, like Thomas Poole's entire side had been had burnt off and, um, and things like that. Um, but they didn't find the boy. So Perry uh, Davis wasn't found. They, there's a couple bones nearby that um, they presume to be Perry's, but, uh, but the actual body was not found, uh, except for the hat that was on a tree outside. Um, so that's also that's kind of stated in the documents as well. Um, what we see, um, and this is something that comes out later in the later trials, is that Scotty was acting bizarre. And I think um, that he seemed to be sort of really nervous. Um, I kind of get this like image of this person just trying to sabotage things at every corner, at every step kind of thing. So like, he is really trying to, um, and this is something I'm, I'm just discovering now, and, and so I don't have the full, the full vision of it yet, but, um, but he, um, like he was trying to get the bodies buried before they did the full investigation, and and all this is not though we don't read that in the first um, the first coroner's jury. Um, we just read it, we read some accusations. So in the first coroner's jury or the first accusations, and the first accusations are against um, are against. Uh, um, someone whose name they, they call Black Jim, um, who's also full, like fuller English name is Jim Queen, and um, his indigenous name is Ya, I think, if I can pronounce it properly. Um, and so, and we'll read, I'll read um, what, that, what that accusation looks like. It's, it's interesting in the sense that it's purely characterological. He says essentially, it is Black Jim who did it because he has a guilty about something. Kind of thing. And supposedly, this Jim was the Jim Queen that our records say was the first on the scene. So, yeah. Um, he was, I think he was. He was the brother in law of Poole. He was the indigenous brother of indigenous from, from what I can sort of put together, like he was he was a close second on the scene. So he was there to spend the night, and this is in the in the coroner's jury inquest as well. Um, he was there to spend the night with Thomas Poole. Um, he was uncle to the children. He liked the children. He was going to spend the night. He thought Tom would have some work for him the next day. Um, and so he was anticipating spending the night. He got there and it was still smoking and still smoking ruins. And you can tell that he was like upset and sort of disturbed by this. He had difficulty going home because he was scared and he tried to find other people to tell about, about the case, about the event, and things like that. Um, so then, um, after after the first accusations, um, so there's um, there's another sort of kind of madness that happened. Um, so Scotty initially accused Black Jim or Yiyao um, of the murder, and in the same breath also accused the Chilcotin Indigenous communities. Um, so he was kind of spreading his net wide. He wanted. Uh, he wanted all sort of suspicion sort of um, directed away from him. And so he was, at every step, he would seem to be kind of sabotaging the trial. Um, and so, but what happened is that he was the first person that was 
um, deputized to search for Black Jim, who is then, by the coroner's jury, accused of the crime. And so the, the end of the, the, uh, the final judgment that the coroner's jury was that um, Black Jim is to be charged and arrested with the murder of, of uh, Thomas Poole and his children, and we will endeavor to find him. Um, and um, and so so both he is a deputized to find Black Jim, but he is also deputized to go find trails um, of to see if there are any sort of uh, uh, trails that were left by the Chilcot and Indigenous communities um, that would have come into the area. Um, they came back from that hunt, so he, he collected uh, 13 um, indigenous um, people to help him search, and they didn't find any trails, just cow trails, and then, and so they went on a hunt for Black Jim. And eventually they found him, but it's also a little bit shady how they found him, um, because even after, like, the after the uh, coroner's jury uh, said that we could arrest him and you were deputized to arrest him, it took him a long time, even though he was interacting with them and things like that. So I think it came to a head like that, that he had to arrest him, otherwise more suspicion would be thrown out. Um, but it was a terrible arrest, and so some of the government's governmental correspondence about it, um, it kind of detailed like how brutal Scotty was to the uh, so he like he tied him up, he tied him to the horse, and he fell off the horse and injured himself on the way. And, um, and so uh, one of the I think one of the correspondences it was the worst treatment of a prisoner that I've ever seen. Um, and and then like the interview um, with with Yao was relatively quick, and he and I think suspicion was was quickly um, thrown then from from Yao onto back onto Scotty. So Constable Livingston, uh, he was the first person in charge of the investigation. He, this, he collected signatures from the community and statements, and I think I found a few of those statements in the archives on this visit. And they're just like little notes, like um, one from Jenny, um, uh, and, a, and a couple other, a couple other notes, um, uh, accusing Scotty of, of committing a crime because he's just being really shady <laughs> through this whole process. Um, <clears throat> All right, and so there's two trials um, that um, that Scotty went through that last uh, over a period of about two years. So it initially started in July of 1879, and they just went through reams of um, uh, reams of witness depositions. Um, everybody in the community itself, like Walter Burgess. Um, uh, Jenny is, is um, the woman he was living with at the time. Um, Annie, there's like a whole pe group of people that were living together, the entire group of people that were living together. Um, and just on and on. Um, and then the second, um, the second trial lasted from November 1880 to December 4th, um, 1880. And there, same thing. They re-examined everybody and, uh, that they that they examined on the first trial. So really detailed. <clears throat> the first trial, I don't have very many documents of. I found uh, one set of microfiche on that, and that trial centers around. Um, are those documents centers around uh, the witness deposition of Jenny? Uh, that's the indigenous woman that was living with Scotty at that time, and it centers around whether or not flour burns. Um, <laughs> um, because um, there's this big thing that, that Thomas Poole had a lot of flour 
in his in his cellar, in his root cellar, and there is none there afterwards during the corners and the burning. So there's none left. Um, but you know, uh, Scotty was seen with a lot of flour <laughs> the next day and a lot of money, <laughs> and, and he was um, you know handing money between like him and Wadi and all these things. So yeah, these things um, sort of exonerated or acquitted of, of the crime. Um, but but afterwards, suspicion was laid on him again by another person, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, the, pretty much the second that, um, that that trial ended was a whole slew of new accusations. Uh, from what I've seen, um, and I'm kind of making this conjecture right now, because I've just found a whole bunch of new documents um, that seem to point to the idea that maybe <coughs> Emia is the same person as Charlie and, and Tamis, or um, some of the writing uh, was just really difficult to read, so, and, it, and consistently difficult, so the name I just did not read at all. Um, um, but in other documents I've also seen the name Nemia or Nemia, but I think they're all one person. Um, <laughs> <laughs> From what I can tell, I, I could be making a conjecture, but I think, um, and it, so it started off, uh, there's a couple interesting documents um, there, and so maybe, oh yeah, okay, and then uh, the next, after all this, um, we get a series of uh, communications from African American fellow uh, David Skinner, and he's implicating Scotty in the murder of. Uh, so let's see. Some of these might not be centered very well, but um, so this is the first sort of coroner's jury, and then in that coroner's jury you see um, you see like the people that are associated with it. So like the men of good standing in Little White and Pemberton. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> And then this is um, Halliday's first accusation. And, and here he's essentially, I can't really read it very well, but from here, but he essentially says, like I mentioned before, I have suspicions that uh, Black Jim was a murderer of Tom Poole uh, because he has a guilty look about him. <laughs> um, and, and that carried some weight um, in a way that maybe other people couldn't say. Um, and, and so, uh, yeah. Um, so you can go. Yeah, so that's from 1879. So this one, this is from the, um, from the initial trial against Scotty. Um, I'm trying to think if I could read them. Um, I don't need to read, read the, these ones, but I, what I found interesting is that there's a map there that I thought you might find interesting. Um, you can see the different houses, so Scotty's house is right there. Um, and then, oh yeah, is that Waddy's right there? The Pemberton there, and then Pools is down there. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm trying to. Anyway, so this is from the first the first trial against Scotty. Um, uh, this is, I think, where like there's really detailed uh, descriptions of of why Scotty is relatively guilty in, in something. Suspicious. <laughs> yeah, quite suspicious. <laughs> so. And this is something that I didn't find previously until this visit. So these are the first documents of the second trial. So what we see here, and I'll read actually some of the um, Crown's uh, uh, statement of, um, of the facts that they, that they had at that time. So this is from um, Judge Creese's bench books. And and the Crown opens the case with the reading of the facts. And so, as, they, as the court sees it at that point. Um, so, let me get to that. So, first, 
Um, okay. The facts in order in which they occurred were as follows. Um, oh wait, let's see here. Okay, I'll, I'll start at, at maybe at the beginning. Um, so, Mr. A. Rock Robertson opens the case for the Crown. Um, Robertson was first describing um, the event at Port Pemberton Portage at Kit Kitterell's place. So there's another mention of Kitterell's, which is interesting. Uh, purchased by Thomas Poole, who lived there with his two uh, children, a girl and a boy. On the 22nd of April, 1880, uh, Poole, I think that was a misnomer, um, because it would have been 1879. Poole is living and his children um, on the 24th April, Indians going from Pemberton Lake to Anderson Lake reported his house burnt to ashes and the exposure to view of the cellar and that the bodies of Poole and his children were in the cellar. An examination showed that all had been murdered and that the house had been set on fire to conceal the evidence. A coroner's inquest was held and at the instigation of the defendant who lived near an Indian named Black Jim was suspected and then also the defendant's instigation, Chilcotin and Indians were, were sus sus suspected. The case as it proceeds will disclose a web of circumstances in addition to direct testimony. So the facts in order which they occurred were as follows. He would sit, set before them first an Indian named Jim Sketch. On the 22nd of April 1878, that's also a misnomer because it'd probably be 1879, um, I guess they didn't really get the names correct in this, this document. Um, <clears throat> the defendant with his, I'm, I'm sorry to keep on saying this word, I, I, it's uncomfortable for me, but just reading from the time that they would use this language. <clears throat> um, defendant with this Indian was at the house of Thomas Poole. They arrived at Poole's on the evening of the 21st. They slept there and left the next morning. <clears throat> then he would deduce as a as a confirmation of the prisoner's guilt, a statement made by the prisoner before the coroner. So at this point, the prisoner is, uh, is Scotty, is James Halliday. <clears throat> on the 21st of, uh, on the evening of the 21st, a quarrel took place. And so they make, um, through, through these witness depositions, they really talk about this quarrel a lot. Um, <clears throat> uh, between the prisoner and Poole, it was so hot that Poole and the defendant though in the same room, ate their meals separately. In the morning, there was another quarrel, and the prisoner refused to partake of the food of Thomas Poole. The prisoner's um, pack, pack train was packed, and he and Sketch were starting when the defendant took the load off one animal and ordered the Indian to proceed to his house with four horses. The, the defendant was then in his shirt, shirt sleeves with no coat or vest on. There he's kind of summarizing <coughs> The, the narrative uh, based on all the different sort of witness depositions at that time. And it sounds like what happened, <clears throat> based on what other people said, is that um, <clears throat> the coat which he had on at, uh, at his house with where, where Jenny and other people were, <clears throat> he had taken off um, at this point. So he <clears throat> got off his coat, took off his, or got off the horse, took off his coat, um, told the pack train to go forward, <clears throat> and he went off to do something else. Um, meanwhile, he took all the flour off of his horse as well. Um, the, <clears throat> the Indian proceeded towards his ranch. On the way, after a long delay, the defendant overtook the Indian and rode up. Um, so they made a good deal about um, how long it would take him to, to meet up with the, the pack train and his indigenous helpers. Um, so he had, he had on, at that point then, his, his coat buttoned up, although the weather was warm. In the evening, on reaching his own house, the defendant still had his coat buttoned up. Blood was then noticed on his shirt sleeve. At the request of a person in the house, the prisoner took off his coat, and his shirt was then seen to be covered with blood. <clears throat> with an E at the end. Blood. <laughs> The shirt was now missing, and the jury can judge what became of it. So, yeah. Um, uh, in the course of this Tuesday evening, the prisoner um, related to the Indian woman 
with whom he was living, that he had had a quarrel with Tom Fool on the subject of his, the prisoners, living with a woman who was the lawful wife of an Indian. So, <clears throat> that means, what that is, is that um, Scotty was living with um, Jenny, and Jenny was um, <clears throat> Black Jim's wife. And so, <clears throat> another, in another witness deposition, there's sort of this funny exchange where um, Hunter Jack, uh, or Captain Jack, <clears throat> was saying to Scotty, like, of course you're scared of Black Jim. You're keeping his wife. <laughs> <clears throat> um, anyways, it's a different time. Um, and the, yeah, okay, so the, um, the next day, Wednesday, the Indian Jim sketch uh, brought up the flower that had been left by the defendant on the pre previous evening at the Indian ranch. Uh, the prisoner did not send the Indian back to Tom Poole's for the fort sacks left there, although on the previous day he had ordered the engine to go for them also. Um, and then it just it just kind of goes on about this, this, whole, um, this whole event. Um, so in every note I found, the, uh, it said that Jeannie was the wife of Hunter Jack, and Hunter Jack, the chief, had multiple wives. So this is new. I've never heard this, but he, this was actually the wife of Tom Poole's brother-in-law that Scotty was with. So it's a completely different story than what we have recorded here. Yeah, and with David Skinner's witness deposition, it even gets richer because <laughs> um, David Skinner um, said that uh, the reason why Scotty wanted David to kill Tom Poole was because Tom Poole had taken his, had, I'm sorry to use these words, but this is kind of the words that, that the witness depositions were using, that Tom Poole had taken his wife and children. So there is some implication that maybe Thomas Poole's two children is actually Scotty's children. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Gets so, better and better. Yeah. Um, so, and these, these are sort of the, the accusations that really don't go anywhere. So we see William Livingston in like the Attorney General correspondence saying, um, Hunter Jack is arrested for the murder of Poole. Um, now we need to look for evidence. <laughs> yeah. Essentially. Um, Sort of Arrest really, first, evidence later. Yeah, a little bit different than how we do it today. Um, this next one is um, is is an accusation. Um, I'm trying to remember who who did the accusation. Um, um, is an accusation of Daniel Corsi, and Corsi had been sort of implicated in the trial. His, his witness statements were given a lot, um, and. Yeah, yeah, so... Um, but that accusation didn't go anywhere. It also didn't go anywhere either, no. <clears throat> yeah, okay. And so these ones, uh, let's see what these ones are. Um, let's see, so... 17. Oh, oh yeah, okay, <clears throat> sorry. Um, so this is sort of the beginning of the manhunts. <clears throat> Um, and there's some interesting correspondence that happens between um, the people that were involved in the manhunts. The first manhunt was conducted by William Livingston. Um, and it's interesting because he's like, I, I, I tracked Charlie through like this miserable, through miserable weather conditions and through miserable mountainous terrain. And so he's just using this rich, rich language to kind of <coughs> describe the um, <coughs> describe like the, the manhunt, and but to no avail. Um, we couldn't find him in the end, <coughs> um, and so I recommend that we uh, we call off this hunt because it's getting too dangerous, and we'll have to start again next <coughs> next time. The <coughs> The second manhunt is by a deputized fellow whose name I only 
can see as Mr. English. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure who he is or what relationship he has to the community. But um, this is, uh, so this is of um, chasing um, the indigenous um, Chilcotin uh, person named Charlie or Nemia or Emia. And, or no, Nemia. Um, there's a few names that we're not very sure of English. Um, he writes, he writes to the Attorney General saying, you know, I have hunted Charlie down, so this would be the next year. The first one was in 1883, and I think this one is now in 1885, so it's already been going for now for a couple of, a couple of years. And so, um, and so he details like, um, oh, oh yeah, so William Livingston is completely convinced that it is Charlie that did the murder. So he's, he is, um, encountered some um, indigenous witnesses that said that um, Charlie has a gold watch that um, that used to be Thomas Poole's and that he was making no bones about um, about a murder of a white person that he had committed. Um, he had been implicated previously of the murder of um, a person from China uh, as well and so he, he's kind of a an outcast um, or an outlaw in, in both the indigenous communities and the settler communities as well. So he's kind of, <clears throat> he's being hunted um, quite a lot. Um, and so William Livingston chases him to view an inlet and then Mr. English takes over the hunt and, <clears throat> and he almost comes close. He misses him by like a day. We, we could see the tracks. Um, that that he crossed over and that would have been his tracks and but he got there you know it's that same sort of story like the smoldering ashes of a, of a campfire and, and no person to be found kind of thing um, and so this interaction I find kind of funny because Mr. English hey. writes to me I've um, taken these indigenous guides to help me find this person these are my expenses it comes out to something like dollars um, can I get reimbursed for them and and the Attorney General LP Reed and this one um, he's like I acknowledge the receipt of your letter however I I don't know what you're talking about and I'm unsure if this is um, what do you say like if this is an official joke or something that I should take seriously so he kind of just like totally discounts it and he's, and he's just like, I don't know, I don't know what's going on. And then William Livingston kind of steps up and like stand, stands up for uh, Mr. English. And that's the last that I hear about it. I kind of wanted to find more information on that exchange. <laughs> so, um, so this is, oh yeah, this is, these are David, David Skinner's letters and witness depositions. And surprisingly, they constitute a lot of documents. <laughs> So like he first writes, um, I think from San Francisco, and then um, and then there's some correspondence that says like, okay, it sounds like David Skinner has some some good information. Let's bring him up. And so they bring him up, or they have a I don't know if they bring him up, or they have a witness um, interview with him, deposition wherever he's he's located. And so that's when it comes out. Um, all this information about um, about Scotty, the relationship between Scotty and Tom School, and the bad blood that they had. And, and finally, <clears throat> so these are the last documents that I could find, um, <clears throat> both in sort of newspaper articles um, at that time, and, or in archival documents. <clears throat> and this is. This is detailing the arrest of Emia. They, they captured Emia finally. <clears throat> they put him on trial. He was sentenced. He was getting, and <clears throat> this, this document by, <clears throat> he was the lawyer in the trials. Um, he was the, he was the defense uh, counselor for the trials. <clears throat> um, during the Scotty, Scotty Halliday trial. 
<clears throat> and for this one, I think he was uh, was the judge. And so he's ordering scaffolding materials, scaffold materials to be set up. So essentially, getting ready to hang Emia. <clears throat> but then we see, I'm trying to see the dates here. <clears throat> the next correspondence is like, okay, wait, wait. <laughs> Um, the colonial government is saying um, that we're giving him a reprieve of three months, and then then there's another couple documents after this that's like, okay, we're letting him free to the recognizance of of uh, the constable who will take him up to to his uh, community, the Chilcoat community, yeah, where he where they're sure he won't commit any further outrages. Against people, and and that's the last of the information. So these are some just some images that I found in in the archive as well around around Lillooet. So this is Lillooet town from 1860, and this is uh, overlooking Lillooet from uh, Lillooet. Sorry, from 1905. I think. So, yeah. I'm yeah, it went on for a long time. Oh,